All right, welcome back. Today we're going to be looking at total internal reflection. But before we do, I sometimes people teach this in a way that you will be given the theory first and then the application. To me, I think a interesting way to do this is let's flip it around. Let's do the application first. So what I want to talk about is fiber optic cables. Essentially what it is, it's a light pipe. If we have a cable that goes like this, and we have a, another material inside of it, so let's say, for example, if I do that one in blue, it's hard. Actually, I kind of messed it up, but I'll continue. Um, I was supposed to have it equal uh, spacing, but it's hard to do. So when we inject a beam of light in here, it will reflect off that inside surface and then reflect again and then reflect again and again and again and again and again and again until it comes out the other side. So that all the light that goes in comes out the other side. And this cable can be uh, bendy, not too much. You can't put hairpin, you can't put hairpin bends in the cable. You can't, you can't do this to the cable, okay? Because, and we'll, uh, I'll explain why in a second. But if you do have any fiber optic in cable in your house, usually you'll have that from your internet service provider uh, if you have fiber uh, internet, don't bend the cable like that. It's, it actually has delicate, uh, the inside is delicate and can crack and break. Also, you shouldn't be uh, bending it like that. So, you know, keep it away from furniture, things like that. Anyhow, um, let's get into the concept of total internal reflection. So if you remember, Last period, or I should say last class, last lesson, we studied these two situations. We studied FSTN and SFAN. Um, what did they look like? Well, if I kind of refresh your memory, we had a boundary and we had light coming in. like this. And for FSTN, this is fast to slow. And so this is, let's say this is could be air, and this could be glass. Uh, and it was in this direction. Now, if we draw the normal, so I could put the normal here in a different color, Now, the light's going to bend, but which way? Well, this is towards the normal. The blue line is the normal. So I end up having the refracted ray go in this direction. So this here is my incident angle, and this here is my refracted angle. The one thing I did not mention to you last period is that in addition to the refracted ray that travels into the second medium, you also have a reflected ray that travels back into the original. So starting here, so it, it doesn't just travel in this direction, it actually splits 
and I'll show you that here. So let's let me show you the reflected ray. I did a good job of that. Okay. Now what I know about this angle here is that that's called theta and I'll use a capital R. So theta capital R is the reflected ray. And theta i is the incident ray. And theta little r is the refracted ray. So notice that there's three of them. Here we have the incoming one, and it splits into the refracted and the reflected. What was the law of reflection? Well, we know that theta i is equal to theta r. That was the law of reflection. But the refracted ray angle, well, for that guy, we need to use Snell's law. Ni sine theta i equals nr sine theta r. However, the other situation that we had last day was superfan, or slow to fast. So if we draw that interface, or that boundary, and in this case, we'll go slow here, and fast here, and we can, we can essentially, we can flip these around. Um, I think I used water in the other example, but it doesn't matter. We can use glass here. And I can use air here. Um, now, when I have this incident ray coming in, so this is the same material, just the opposite order. Now I have my incident ray. And now I have my, OK, hold on a second. Let me, let me create my um, normal there. So now that I have my normal line, I'm going to create my refracted ray. This angle here, oops, let me change colors there. This angle here is my incident angle. Now this is away from the normal. That means I'm going to go that direction. And my, th therefore, here is my theta r. And now I'm going to draw my reflected ray. And there it is. And this is my reflected ray. Once again, remember, theta i equals theta capital R. Incident equals reflected. That's the law of reflection. And again, the same thing applies for the refracted. We have to use Snell's law. However, what's different about this is that you'll notice here, let me write this out for FSTN, notice that how can we compare the two angles? In other words, how can we compare theta i and theta r? We know theta i is equal to reflected ray. That we know. That's the same for both. Okay. But for the refracted ray, which is the small r, how are these related in this situation? Well, if you'll notice, you can just see it by looking at it. You know that theta r is less than theta i. Theta i is bigger. Whereas for this situation, we, we can see that theta i is smaller than theta r. Right? Theta r is actually 
a bigger angle to the dotted blue line than theta i is. And this is all due to the fact of the indices of refraction. In other words, glass, air has an indice of refraction of 1.0003, approximately 1. And glass has an index of refraction of about 1.5. I think, what is it? I think crown glass is 1.52 or something. We, we can just leave it as 1.5. So this one's 1 1.5. And this one's that. Notice that the reason why these angles because, become what they are, even if we're using this, the same initial incident angle, it's because of the indices of refraction. However, here is the interesting thing. As we increase this angle of incidence in the super fan, in the slow to fast situation, theta r gets bigger and bigger and bigger until, and this is the critical point, until theta r equals 90 degrees. So in order to show you this, we need to do a little bit of an experiment. OK, so here we have an experiment that you can do online. It's at phet.colorado.edu. And it's the bending light uh, simulation. And it's a, it's a nice uh, free simulation that you can use. And uh, it's a great way to learn this topic. So what I can do here is I have a light source. And I can turn it on and I can rotate it. And I can even change the mediums. I have some different mediums that I can choose that the between the two uh, interfaces. So here I have white and purple. The purple is glass and the white is air. And I can even have this um, angle uh, measuring device. So yeah, this is a protractor. OK, got to remember that. So um, let's turn on the light here. And when I turn on the light, you'll notice that you can see both the incident ray is here. Then you see the refracted ray into the glass. And you see very faintly here, you can see the reflected ray. Now notice the intensity of the reflected ray gets, the reflected ray gets bigger and like stronger and stronger the closer we come down to an incident angle of 90 degrees, right? The, tr the refracted ray, the, the ray that goes into the glass, gets weaker and weaker. But notice something clearly here, is that no matter what angle we choose, we always have a refracted ray and a reflected ray. So some of the ray, in other words, as the ray comes down, some of it is reflected back into the air and some of it goes into the glass. More of it will be reflected with a bigger angle. Okay, you can see the reflected ray gets stronger. But what if, so this, 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 what situation is this? This is FSTN. This is fast to slow. In other words, we're starting here. The light direction is going in this direction. Air is fast and glass is slow. Glass has an index of refraction here of 1.5. The bigger the index, the slower the material, right? However, let's flip it around so that we get the super fan situation. And now I want to show you what's going to happen. Then this is, there's a special situation here. So if I change this to glass and I change this to air, now you can see what's going to happen. As I increase the angle of incidence, notice what's happening to the angle 
of refraction. Notice this angle of refraction here. It disappears at this point. And notice if I make this angle bigger, we have no refracted ray. The refracted ray is gone. It doesn't exist anymore. Do you know what the implication of that is? It means that this boundary between the two interfaces, between the air and the glass, is acting as a perfect mirror. Now I think you're starting to get the understanding of that fiber optic cable diagram that I gave you at the beginning. That's what's happening inside of the fiber optic cable. We have the boundary between the two different media acting as a perfect mirror as long as this incident angle is sufficient. If it's big enough, none of it goes into the second material. But if it's too small, look what happens. Boom. Now I've made this angle too small and some of it goes into the air. So this is a really, really interesting phenomenon. Let's take a look at the math behind this, OK? So let's make some room here. And let's focus on the SFAN situation where the, we could say when, theta r equals 90 degrees. Now if I drew this for you, here it is, okay? If I draw it for you, here's my dotted line, which is the normal, okay? And then we will draw the incident ray Now, there, this angle here is theta i, but here's the interesting thing, is that theta r, the refracted ray, so I can perhaps do this in a different color. Um, let me pick, let's pick dark blue maybe, because I, I don't know if I want to pick black because the boundary is black. So there it is. That means this angle here is theta r. And if you'll notice, theta r is 90 degrees perpendicular to the normal. This guy's the normal. So the question now is, what is theta i? Well, let's go back to Snell's law. We'll say ni sine theta i equals nr sine theta r. OK? And now, let's figure out what is sine theta r. That's the sine of 90 degrees. Now, you should know that the sine of 90 degrees is equal to 1. So that means the equation becomes ni sine theta i equals nr. Now we don't need to multiply by 1 because multiplying by 1 doesn't change anything. It doesn't change the equation in any way. Except here's what's different. Instead of calling this variable theta i, I am now going to call it theta c. Why theta c? I don't want to call it theta i anymore. It is the incident. But theta c is important because it's the critical angle. And that's the name we give it. Critical angle. So critical is the subscript c. And that is the angle for which the refracted ray will be along the boundary. Anything greater, any, so in other words, 
any incident angle greater than the critical angle and the interface behaves as a perfect mirror. So the question now is, what is theta c? How can we calculate it? Well, let's take this equation and solve for theta i, which is theta c in this case. So <coughs> we would just say theta c is equal to, we'll take the ni and put it on the other side. In other words, divide, go nr divided by ni, and take inverse sine. And we'll say inverse sine of nr over ni. And that is the equation for the critical angle. It's the inverse sine of the ratio of the indices of refraction. nr divided by ni inverse sine gives you the critical angle. So knowing this, <clears throat> let's figure out what is the critical angle for glass and air. That means between air and glass, and we have to say which direction, right? Going from glass to air, theta c is equal to the inverse sine of, remember what the index of refraction of, of glass was? Uh, sorry, that's wrong. Because in this case, this is the incident and this is the refracted, right? So nr in this case is 1 divided by 1.5. I know it's 1.0003, but let's just do this for now. Now let's calculate what the critical angle is. So for this angle, I got 41.8 degrees. That's my critical angle. Now, let's test this out. Let's go back to the uh, simulation, and let's see if we can find that angle of 41.8 between uh, air and glass. OK, so here we are. Now, in order to see that angle, we need this protractor. Let's put it here, centered right at the middle. Okay, we're good. Now, let's see where 41, let's say 41.8 is basically 42. So where is this? There's 30. And remember, look at the indices of refraction. 1.5, that's what we calculated, and 1. Okay, great. And again, I stress, this is only going to work if we are coming from the slow to the fast. And we are in this case. So 30 there's 40 right there, and so 42 would be just about here. Okay, so let's push it down and let's see what happens. And now you notice it disappeared. We are now, we, we were at the critical angle just a second ago, right about, right about there is the critical. So any angle, and then it's any infinitesimal angle greater than the critical angle. The, remember, what's the definition of critical angle is when the refracted ray is traveling along the boundary. And now we have total internal reflection. No more ref, refracted ray. OK? This is very different from the other situation, FSTN. If we flip it around, if we make this air and we make this glass, this will never have total internal reflection in this situation. Okay? FSTN does not result in total internal reflection. There is no critical angle. Okay? It'll only work when going from slow to fast. And at this point, when you hit that 42 degrees critical angle, Boom. The refracted ray is gone, and the interface behaves as a perfect mirror. 
And so I wanted you to see that. We calculated that number and we verified it using the protractor. Okay, so before we go back to our calculations, let's do one more and verify it again just for practice. So let's pick a different material other than glass. Let's pick water. And on this side, we can pick air. Now, notice the index of refraction is different. So what I want you to do here, let me turn off the, what I'd like you to do is pause the video and see if you can figure out what is the critical angle between water and air. See if you can figure out the critical angle and then we'll verify it. Pause the video now. Okay, let's try and solve this in two different ways. Let's try and do it experimentally and then let's try it uh, mathematically. So let's turn on the laser and let's start moving it down and see what angle we're at. All right. Oh, there it is. Okay. It looks like that angle is just before 50. So there's 30, 40, 50, but we haven't hit 50 yet. So it's just it looks like it's just un under there it, there you can see it now it's disappeared so it's not quite on the 50 but just before let's now go and take a look and see if we can calculate this mathematically okay so let's draw another image now in this case I want to put it in, in the same orientation as uh, there's our equation. Let's leave that visible. I want to put it in the same orientation as we had in the, in the thing, but I'm going to do it flipped upside down. Because usually air is up here and water is down here. Usually you don't have water on top of air. You have it the other way around. So now here is our normal. And then we have our incident ray and we have our theta i and in this case we have our critical or I should say our critical angle is when our refracted ray is 90 degrees and so our equation from you can see it up there is theta c is equal to the inverse sine of nr over ni and nr in this case is air so we're gonna have the inverse sine of 1.003 divided by water here, let's put a, put down the indices. And water, I think, in this thing was, uh, oops, nope, that's not right. It's not 1.5. It's 1.33. So we'll go 1.33. Essentially, for now, you could simply just, the 0003 is really small. So you can just reciprocate 1.33 and take the inverse sign of that. And that comes out to 48.8 degrees. And that is our critical angle for from water to air. Okay? So that's great. Notice notice it's 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 bigger because glass has a higher index of refraction so the angle was even less so let's let's kind of think about some implications of this between this water and air one for example here is a, a real life situation because I, I we, we it all it's all fine and dandy 
if you think of it in terms of math, but how does this relate to the real world? Well, what if we have a, let's kind of move this up a little bit more, we can still see the angle there. What if we have some water, and what if we have a boat in the water, and what if we have a person in this boat, and they're, they have a buddy that's scuba diving down here, but his foot, the scuba diver's foot, is stuck in the rocks. And he's running out of oxygen. So what he decides to do is he has a flashlight. He takes his flashlight and he turns it on, pointed directly at the person in the boat. So the light travels straight up to the boat. Maybe I could do that again because it kind of should be pointing towards the person's eyes. There. Now the problem with this is, this is fine as long as, so this person will see the light, but if this angle If this angle is greater than the critical angle, then if theta i is greater than the critical angle, then you'll have total internal reflection and none of the light will reach the person. And so the person in the boat will not see this person. Perhaps it would be it, it it would be even worse if the boat was moved further to the left, you know. Like, for example, if the boat if the water was oops wrong color for the water, if the if the water was, uh, if the boat was over here. Now in this case, this would be much worse because the light would have to travel at a bigger angle and so now theta i is bigger here theta i is smaller so in this case if the boat is close to the person they could see them but if the boat is further away the angle of incidence becomes too big and now you have total internal reflection so in this case it would be it could be okay the, the light is still going to be bent so, but he may still be able to see some of it, like on his clothes and whatnot. But in this case, none of it is coming out. All of it's going to go back into the water. So the person in the boat will never see the person in the, with his foot stuck under the water. Let's do one more example. And for this example, hope that makes sense. For this example, let's say you are stranded on a, so here's, there's water. You're stranded on a desert island. And so here is the desert island. And you are the only thing you've been able to find on this desert island is some sticks. And so here you are standing on the edge of the water and you have a stick in your hand and you are really hungry. You want to catch some fish and there is some fish in the water. But unfortunately, you keep missing the fish when you throw the spear at the fish. I want to see if you can figure out why you're missing. So before, you, before you, I give you this problem, 
what I want you to think about is usually when you throw something, a rock or a spear or whatever, anything that you want to hit, you throw it directly at the object where you see it to be. That's natural and that's instinctual and that's the way it works in air. In other words, if somebody is here and you see an object here, well, with your eyeballs, it's a straight line between what you're seeing and where you want a projectile to go. It's, it's where you see it. The problem here is that the fish is in a different medium. The fish is in the water and you, your eyes, are not. You're in the air. See if you can figure out why does the person miss the fish if they always throw the spear directly where they see the fish. Pause the video now. All right, let's see if you guys were able to figure this one out. Let me change to a green color here. And let's draw the ray of light coming from the fish. So the, the light reflects off of the fish into the person's eyes. And this is the path that it takes. That is the path that the light takes to the person's eyes. Remember, this is the direction of the light. And remember, if I draw in the, uh, if I draw, let's say, a black line here for the normal, it's bending away from the normal. This is a super fan situation because it's going from the water to the air. And there is this, that's the situation. Obviously, if the, if the angle of incidence was too big, you wouldn't see the fish at all. However, where, was, where is the person going to throw the spear if they throw the spear directly at where they think the fish is? Remember what I told you before, when we live on the planet, we always assume things are where we see them. So where does this person think that he or she sees the fish? So if we extend this, let's kind of change colors again. If we extend this line in a straight line, then we get the fish appearing to be here. And so this person will throw his spear, the spear, at this location. And they will always miss the fish. Instead, they need to realize, they need to remember their physics lessons and of refraction. And then they realize that, oh, if I see the fish here, I need to throw the spear closer to me and then they will hit the fish on their mark here. And that's, that's another application of refraction. Thanks for watching and now you know how to spearfish.